Well, this morning we have the uh, distinguished honor to have Dr. John Perkins uh, with us today. And, and if you don't know who, who Dr. Perkins is, I want to uh, give a little biographical information on him. And then I just want to tell about my personal experiences. But uh, Dr. Perkins was born in 1930 into poverty in Mississippi. He was the son of a sharecropper. And he, um, through a, a number of trials and challenges, he ended up moving. He, he, his brother was murdered by a, a, a police marshal, and, and he ended up moving to California. And from there, he ended up as a, a voice in the civil rights movement, one of the leading voices in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And as a result of his involvement in the civil rights movement, he experienced uh, constant harassments, uh, imprisonment, and, and beatings because of standing up for, you know, equality, that there would be human dignity, that black, white, Latino, Asian would all experience the same treatment. Well, he's one of the leading voices, uh, evangelical voices that emerged from the civil rights movement. And he is the president and emeritus, uh, president emeritus of the John and Vera May Perkins Foundation for Reconciliation and Development. He would want you to know he's been married to his wife, Vera May, for 66 years. They have eight children, 13 grandchildren, and some great-great-grandchildren, but I don't know how many. Eight great-grandchildren. And so uh, he's authored 17 books. He holds 15 honorary doctorates. If you look him up on Wikipedia, his biographical information is longer than my arm. He's, he's really been one of the key, key figures in evangelical Christianity that's continued to hold the line on racial unity. And I would just say this, that earlier this year, uh, myself, Bishop Garland Hunt, uh, Hazen Stevens, Josh Clemens, who are all the, the key leadership team of One Race, we were able to visit with Dr. Perkins uh, there in his office in Jackson, Mississippi. And it was transformative. Uh, Dr. Perkins is 89 years old and he has a lifetime uh, uh, wealth of wisdom, not just rooted in civil rights or, or, or human dignity, but rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we're standing there this morning, he just reaches over to me and he says, this isn't about just getting black and white together. This is about being born again. <laughs> You've got to be born again. And um, as we spent time with him that day, he just unloaded on us for about half a day. And I realized I'm, I'm sitting here receiving from one of the, the leading, uh, really the leading thinkers, the, the leading voices for uh, unity and reconciliation in our time. And um, I just want to mention this book. We have it available in the lobby, uh, One Blood by Dr. Perkins. He wrote it in, in 2018. This is your magnum opus, isn't it? This is, the, this is the one where he kind of takes all of his life's work and consolidates it in, in one volume. I read this book in one sitting, and it, it was so clarifying on so many points for me. And I wanna just mention two things. The chapter on lament is worth the whole book. It's worth the whole book because he explains in an accessible way what biblical lament looks like and the requirement of it for the church today. We've almost lost that in the, in the modern church. The chapter on lament alone is, is worth the whole book. And then the other chapter I just have to call out, it's called One, uh, one Blood, One Race. And so in 2018, while he was, this book was being published, of course he had written it over the previous years, was exactly the time that the One Race movement was coming out. And in his chapter, One Blood, One Race, he actually gives the foundational thoughts as to why we named our movement One Race. Now we did it independently of one another. And that's the Holy Spirit. That's yes. the work of God in this hour declaring that each of us are not some color code, that each of us are the same in God's eyes, whether we're black, 
white, Asian, Hispanic, some other culture or nationality. We are all one race. We all have the same blood flowing through our veins. Did you know our DNA is 99.5% the same? We are all one in Christ. And so I want to really encourage you, get this book. It will help you. It will clarify for you. And it is our privilege and our honor this morning to host Dr. John Perkins. And so I want to ask you just to give him a great God bless you as he comes this morning. Dr. Perkins. Turn your mic on real quick. We're honored to have you. All right, get you all tucked in here. Perfect. Give me a grab it. Coming over here. Yeah. Now, as he's sitting down, we are going to do this in interview fashion. But let me just tell you, this is a preacher of the gospel of Jesus. So I may not get to a ask a single question, but I'm going to look really good next to him. But before we get started, would you just receive the people and what's, what's on your heart? Wow. This, to me, is the fulfillment, I think, of part of the greatest biblical longing in the history of the world. As I look back at the biblical idea. It ought to be the greatest, well, joy in reality is the fulfillment of longing, longing. All the longing of the years was met when those angels said, behold, I bring you good news of the greatest joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this night the fulfillment of God's promise that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head. It, it is the fulfillment of the brokenness of humanity that happened in the Garden of Eden. The Lord, behold, I bring you good news of great joy who shall be to one people, one people. For you was born this day in the city of David. Uh, what purpose is all of this? The purpose for sin is born to you this day, a savior. That's our problem. We don't know our problem. We're dealing with the results of sin. And we're making them bigger than grace. We're fighting the wrong fight. We are made something bigger. We are made our behavior of sin bigger than grace. It was born this night in the city of David, a savior from sin who is Christ the Lord. We're fighting the wrong fight. We're fighting a racial fight. No, we are not. It's a sin fight. We are broken. And the problem is, we don't know the depths of our broken, and we sort of think that one of us is broken more than the other one. We are broken evenly. We were broken before we were color coded. <laughs> we were broken in Adam and Eve. Color code and just make it easier to hate. Breaking us up into this ethnicity, and then God did that one because He made us 99 and whatever percent the same, and the only difference is the texture of our skin and that related to where we emerge from in society. And so the reconciliation is bringing us back to God. 
I believe that the way we play racist segregation now is really itself is damaging. Because we don't make white folks racism, we have called that racism. They have made ours black and they have color coded us and they say, let's get together. Well, what we're going to do is fight. Because for even when we talk about it, we're making white supremacy and that we'll be okay and we can get to be like white folks. And when we're talking about race, we're dehumanizing both of us. I haven't met no white folks who want to be racist. I haven't met no black folks who want to be niggers. Who wants to be Nigga color coded black. And so we are playing a racial game that's not getting any better. It's not healing. The healing is what Jesus did at Calvary. He showed us our oneness and his love. Yes, sir. We're walking around today asking questions like, whose life matters. I, am I in an insane asylum? God kissed life into that clay and we become living souls. It's one life. One life. God blew this into the human. That's what the genealogy is about in the Bible. Every time God get into a, a tight place, he tells us we're from Adam. Every time he gets into it, that's what genealogy is about. What are we fighting about? We're fighting because we're broken. We're fighting because all of we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to our own way. But the Lord has laid upon him, Jesus, the sin of us all. That's what the cross is about in life. And boy, being here with you guys is seeing that now being lived out. Being lived out. God is doing this. This ain't natural. This takes God's presence. This takes God's presence. And, and, and in reality, if you would want to know what is God in finality, God is a spirit. And what is a spirit? He's present. He can be every place at the same time. He's present. We have a present God. And this present God is taking his own initiative, bringing us together again. Yes, again. Bringing us together again. And so I'm yes here. I'm telling you, this is like you invited me. Lord have mercy to be invited into this. To be invited into this. I know I'm color coded. I'm not going to steal anything. You can, you can rest for sure. But you invited me. You, you trusted me. You trusted me. And we're here together to worship God. And so I'm just honored. I can't be. Uh, I'm just honored to be 89 years old and seeing what I have longed for so long. Becoming, I don't think we can turn back. Sometimes I meet some of my successful businessmen, and when you get really successful, you believe you can stop anything. I don't believe they can stop this. I don't think this has to do with silver and gold. I think this has to do with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Peter said we wasn't pusher with money or silver and gold, but we was precious by the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ God's son, keep on washing us from all our sin. What we got to do is do what we are doing. Coming here and acknowledging him and confessing our sin. Confessing our sin. And he said if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just. That's all that God can be. That's all that God, God can't be no more than faithful. He can't be no more than just to wash all our sins away. And that's what he's doing here. I'm honored to be here. Amen. That's a short sermon. <laughs> That's a short sermon. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, Dr. Perkins, you've lived 89 years 
you lived a long life and you're not nearly done yet. But we want to just look into your life a little bit and tell us a little bit about yourself, your, your upbringing, just how you were raised. Tell us about your mom. Tell us how you ended up in California from Mississippi. Yeah, it's good because I think it, we're born with a purpose. But if you can find that purpose, I mean, Rick Warren found it. And now he's the greatest Christian writer in the history of the world. He found it. God has a purpose for our life. He has a plan. That plan is for good and not for evil, to give us a hope in life. Well, you're, you're born that way. So what I want to tell you now is about my born that way. Now, you have to look back then and see that and try to fit that into God's plan, find his will, find his talent, and, and find his giftedness, and to find out what is the fruit of the Spirit and what are your calling in life. It, it's almost you have to look back at that because you're seeing it in unroll. You find it in role. That's what makes history so, so important. That's what the Bible is about. It's the story about God. It's his story. And those people who met God and how they were affected by God. That's the Bible. It's the word of God. It's the word. It's God's word working it itself out in obedience to those people that he called. And he called each one of us to do that. We all have been called. It's a matter of hearing that voice. He's all been called. And so I think it started when my mother died when I was seven months old. Uh, my mother died within a plantation. We didn't have a milk cow. And they tell me that uh, uh, she died of, uh, it's on her birth certificate, she died of perligo. That's the way they announced then nutrition deficiency. She wasn't getting enough milk. I was probably taking the milk out that she needed for her normal life. She died and I lived. As I look back at that, I think I found my purpose. I think I found my purpose. I think I found my purpose of life. How did I find it? My father dropped us off at my mother's, his mother's house. She had been the mother of 19 children. Uh, and I grew up in a non-Christian family. Uh, most of my cousin was half cousin, half this and half that, and half brothers and sisters. We was bootlegging, you know, so we were not religious. So I grew up without that religion. Uh, my Mother, grandmother gave away three of the kids. One of my sisters, she just got lost. My boyfriend killed her. My oldest brother, he went into the military to fight Hitler and came to fight against Hitler and Nazism. And he came back and he was killed in his own hometown, trying to, at a theater. That's what got me from California, from Mississippi to California, because they thought we was, uh, would be that way. And one of the saving elements in my life as I look back, I never thought I was inferior. That's a powerful deal, I'm telling you that. I, I'm telling you to profile people and dehumanize them and make yourself too better than them is an evil deal. But the other side of that, if you don't be profiled and don't believe you what society says about you, you got some revolutionary stuff in you. You, you got some energy that could be turned loose because you got some real truth. Our Constitution affirms that. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all human beings are created equal, as is endowed by that creator with certain rights, chief among those a life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the American experience was to be a model of the kingdom of God. We was to be this one nation on earth with li from all nations with liberty and justice. For I sin is bad. I sin is bad because we backed away from too dynamic a truth. Nothing can be more perfect 
than self knowledge. We hold these truths to be self evidence. It all in. When he said he was creating him and God, God was serious. God was serious. And so that wasn't released. I, that, the energy of that wasn't released until many years later when I was in California. My young son went to some good news clubs. We call them child evangelism. I'm not a religious person. You know, I would see these churches, these big white churches. It would say religion today. Everybody welcome. If you'd have went, that'd have been a riot. In fact, if I'd have went to one of the schools, the National Guard would have got me. Much less the church. The deacon would have got me then. My boy went to a good news club. White and black was teaching these good news clubs. That was something different in itself. And he came home, he was singing a little song. God loves the little children. All the children of the world, red, brown, and yellow, black, and white. They all pray. They wasn't singing that in Mississippi. <laughs> they wasn't singing that in many black churches. They'd have been scared to say that. Black folks were really scared. White folks wouldn't have said it either. But those children were singing red and yellow, black and white. My son came home and said, I said, that sounds like nothing I've never heard before. By this time, I'm searching for God. But this time, I've come to the end of my knowledge. Boy, begin to try to, as a, if God loved me enough to give his only begotten son to die for me, I want to know that God. That's God's purpose for life. To, to know God is it. To know God and to make him known is the orthodoxy of the orthodoxy, and there is no religion basically that denies that. No Protestant religion. The, our mission is to know God and to know him better and deeper and to love him more. And it says, hey, the Good Samaritan story is the story of what it looks like to be a Christian. The Good Samaritan story is to see somebody in the ditch and your religion don't stop you from in getting in a ditch with him. That good Samaritan, that, 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 that was a mixed breed. He was everything they hated. That's an oxymoron for a Jew to talk about a good Samaritan. He saw two Jews, he, he saw a Jew in the ditch. Two Jews, the one that's supposed to make God known to him, a priest. The one who was to educate him about God, the lawyer, the Levite, they left him in the ditch. And a Samaritan came along. He saw the dignity in the humanity. His life was still there. His life was still there. His life was still there. He would have probably looked over there. If his life wouldn't have been there, he could have said, there's a dead Jew in the ditch. And the other Jews didn't stop, and so I'm not stopping. But he went to him. He bound up his wound. There is a bomb in Gideon. There is a bomb in Gideon. There is a bomb in Gideon. That bomb is God's love. That bomb is God's passion. You're ready to serve God when you're willing to enter into the pain and the suffering of others. Wow. Come unto me, Jesus said. Wow. Come unto me, all of you that are burdened and the heavy laden, and, I, and I'll give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I'm meek. Oh, Lord, I'm lonely. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord, have mercy. To have your longing fulfilled with the presence of someone. God said, I want you. I'm longing for you. Isn't that something? Come unto me. Well, I heard that voice. I heard that voice of Jesus saying, come unto me and rest. I found in him a, a resting place. And that's what we find in. We're finding that. We're going to find that in our fellowship. It's going to be good for us to touch all humanity. It's going to be good for this congregation here to become color-coded, if you please, or decolor-coded, or decolored. Make it like going to a football game on a beautiful day where all the beauty of the colors come out together. That's the way God made us. We are beautiful and wonderfully made. We got a God. But I, I think it takes this kind of practice. I, I think this, I think what, I can preach about this, but if we're not practicing, it don't seem like it works. It seems like it works better when we practice it. That's how I got started. <laughs> then, then, then God said, I went to some prison when I was uh, now a young guy, 27 years old now, raising my family. And I went to a prison in California. And when I got to that prison, more than half of the prison was black. I saw my Mississippi Ebonic speaking brothers. You know, I speak Ebonic. I don't speak English. I'm, I'm, I'm remembering the English y'all taught me, and I'm trying to translate it with y'all. <laughs> Abonic is my first language, and so it takes me a little longer to speak because I got to translate it because I, I think in Abonic, and I have to then translate it to what I've heard you white folks say, English. <laughs> so so, so, so I, I, I saw those kids there. And when I told them what I've told you guys, they were back in the back, those little black boys, were back in the back, and they were shaking and crying. It was so dynamic. I don't know what happened to those black. And I went back there and tried to talk to them. I did talk to them, and I said, why are you shaking? And they said, your story is my story. That's when I knew God called me to preach. I knew at that moment God called me. The other time I realized it is when I was in a Brandon jail in Mississippi in 1970 when I was being tortured by a white policemen, highway patrol. I saw Eva. I looked Eva and death in the eyes. And I saw myself, my broken self. Because if I'd have had a, if I'd have had an atomic hand grenade, I would have pulled a plug, and all of us would have been dead. That's when I saw I was just as evil as those who was killing me. I didn't have the means to be that evil, and that's when I said to God, God, if you lead me out of, get me out of this jail tonight. I want to preach a gospel that is stronger than my blackness. I want to preach a gospel that is stronger than my race. I want to preach a gospel that is stronger than my economic ambition. I got that to drive. I want to preach a gospel that can reconcile us. That's why I'm here. That's why it's thrilling me. That's why I'm here. You guys are trying to do that the best way you can. It ain't easy. You are trying to make a prototype of what the kingdom of God looks like. In heaven, they're there from every ethnic, every color, every nationality. They're there worshiping God. Who are these? Who are these? Yes, so those are the ones who suffered together. They suffered together. They met each other. 
and they enter into our pain together, we rejected the lie. We rejected the lie. I believe that God has called us for that, y'all. I think God has called his church to that. Let's don't try to find ways to hate each other. Let's be looking for ways to embrace each other. All of us know we are better together. than. I believe it has to do with, with what's going on in El Paso. I believe it having to do with what's going on in Dayton. I think, I think we done made hate a value. And hate was to be a warning. Hate was never to be a value. You was never to shape hate in a way that it benefited you. Right. It don't, it's not supposed to have any human value. It needs to be fearful. It, it only could be used in the, in the, to get away from fear. It only could be used in getting away from fear, but not value. Not to better the other one. It was, it, it was not to be used even on a, a basketball court. That's what makes the athletics so powerful. Because the humanity is on display. The humanity is on display. And that's what y'all are doing here. Let's do the best we can. Let's keep trying a little more. Let's keep loving each other a little more. Let's keep loving God a little more. That might be the way is to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And then try to love your neighbor like you're loving yourself. I, I think that might be the fulfillment of the commandment. Love might be the final fight. Love might be the final fight. And I think they will say we'll understand, we'll understand that we're one people. Jesus said, I came to make you one that you might be more. Love is of God. He that loves is born of God. He that loves not knoweth not God, because God is love. That's the way. We got to be affirmative. We got to put dignity up front. We got to stop calling each other racist. We, we got to stop calling, each, and I, so I think we done now, uh, we're trying to color coat the world. I'm afraid we're trying to color code the world. If I was white, I'd be afraid. That population is going down. In birth rate, in all kind of rates, in these other parts. Oh, Lord, we don't need no more of this. We need to be the church. And I believe God created the church for that. I think that's his name. They are the call out to represent him in love. He calls us out of our tent, out of our home, to hear the word of God and then be engaged in the affairs of this world. Okay. Yeah. That's the way I got into it. <laughs> you know, let me tell you this though. You need to know this. When I got out of that jail, we gotta be trusted ourselves. Cause I I think I was trying to bribe God. Because when I got out of jail, I didn't want to do it. I wanted to be a victim. I think we like being a victim. I, 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 I don't think we want to be really responsible for others. And being a victim means I'm not responsible. Somebody else calls me to do this. The people who healed me when, and I got out of jail were these whites and blacks that came to my bedside. Now, really, real reconciliation is us washing the wounds that we cause others. Washing one another's wounds. That's what happened to Paul on the master's road. And I was washed. Go to and I. What must I do? Go get your wound washed. There's somebody there going to wash your wound. That's what happened in the Philippian jail. They went down there and those Romans beat a pus out of them. But when they said, what must we do to be saved? 
Paul says, don't, 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 don't kill yourself. We love you. And the jailer got the, the light and went down there who had beat him and started washing their wounds. That's what reconciliation is. That is a little bit bigger than reparation. That's a little bit more bigger than that. I don't need what you have now. I need my moon wash. We need our wound washed from the hatred that we have given already. Let's wash with each other's wound. That's what this church is about. I'm here. You don't know how wonderful this is. Y'all talking about talking about me. Y'all talking about me. I'm, 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 I'm so wonderful that y'all are engaging in this. I'm so wonderful that you're trying to find other places to be engaged. Not keep running from each other. We're running when we're running white folks out of town, and when they come back, they call it gentrification. The blacks get mad. We all, all we're doing is playing games. Oh, let's wash each other's wounds. So let's wash each other's wounds. So you That's said, my story. So as we get ready to wrap up, you said something that, that was really interesting, that we can't serve the Lord unless we enter into someone else's pain. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm a, I'm a white man, if you haven't noticed, right? Yeah, I like, I like, so, I like that makes me feel victorious. <laughs> so, I can wash your wound. <laughs> you might have had to need to get beaten and brought to this hospital. Where I'm at. That's what happened to me. Yeah. And those white folks washed my wound. I didn't want them to wash my wound. They washed my wound anyway. So tell me this. So I want you to speak to me and every white person in the room right now. I want you to speak to us as white people. You know, and how how can we do this? How can we enter into the wounds of our black brothers and sisters, in particular here in the South? Speak to us. Help help me to do that well. I'm gonna go theological first, because it's true. Because we can create a program, and if you don't have any redemption in it, you might miss. So so let me go theological with this. The Lord's Supper was memorialized. And what happened at the Lord's Supper? Jesus washed all of them feet. That's what was dirty, their feet. And the ones who washed the feet is the lonely one, is the lowly one. But they had a meal. It was a grand meal. And then they memorialized it and told us to remember the memorializing it. It was a cut down many expression of life. The life of the flesh is in the blood and the wine represented the blood. What makes the, bread, the blood whole and good is food. When we eat, there is a possibility of all of our senses being open. We smell, we taste, we hear, we feel. If you hear John talking about it, it was like he talked about that event. I put my hands in his breath. I smell his must. I smell the food that was cooking. This is love, and that's what he says in 1 John. 1 John hooks us up with this eternal God, but also this resurrection Jesus at the same time. That which we have heard, that which the eyes have seen, that which we have looked upon, that which we have smelled as much, we have tasted him. I, I write this letter unto you, that you might know him, that you might have fellowship with him. And truly that fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. 
What is that called? Friendship. And if I talk to somebody and they say they're not my friend, I'm going to go after them. I'm going to go after them. Friend, when you find God, you find a friend. The biggest question in the Bible is what did Abraham, the founder of our faith, did find? He found the way to God. He found the grace of God. He found the bigness of God, and he called Abraham his friend. When Jesus found, of when the disciples found Jesus, Andrew said, we have found him in whom the prophets did prophesy. Who is he? He's Jesus, the son of Joseph. And Jesus is going to tell him six months later, don't call me great teacher. I'm not, all right, but call me friend. So my new book that's coming out is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. All our sin and griefs he bears. What a privilege it is to carry. We got a God in heaven. I, th- I think we made him too small. I think we're still trying to put God in our little box. We're trying to take God to doctrine too quick. Come on. The true doctrine of God is to know him and to make him known and to love him. Yeah. Those are the doctrines of God. That truth don't have in the bottom. You're going to make up these other little doctrines. What they do is split the church. The church is split on doctrine. It's, it's split on minor beliefs. We make our little thing what it is, and we start another one. In my community, we made it uh, First Corinthians. We split up. We made it Second Corinthians. We made it Mount Zion, and the new one was Greater Mount Zion. That's, that's what we do. Knowing God, making God known, worshiping him, working for him, serving for him, that's the doctrine of God. You got it. That's a, and, 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 that, and that three, worshiping him, Working for him and serving him is the same word. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you would present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, which is a reasonable work, which is a reasonable worship, which is a reasonable service to God. God wanted him to serve him. You serve him when you're washing your brothers and sisters' feet. When we are doing that, we're serving God. We're serving each other. I think that's what we got to. That's what we got to do. And and, and 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 the way we do that is be intentional in planting churches. The church is the worship center. That's what we did this morning. They lifted up God for us to know about Him, His love. And we. This, this is special. This is not to be neglected. This is strong. Somehow I didn't serve God watching my television. No. I can serve you. You're getting some good information. That's good information sometimes. But the information now have been put on my favorite one. Fox, believe what I believe. It got the political slant I got. NNN, CNN, it got the other doctrine I have. And so we're not really having no fellowship with that. We're reaffirming what we already uh, believe. We're not digging any deeper for belief. We're not digging deeper for that. We already know that. And that's what we do with politics. You think the Tea Party can help you. You think that the conservatives can help you. Don't put me in that democratic harsh pot. They're all equal. They're all equally broken. They don't enhance God's word. 
they don't bring us any fresh news. And we think we got to have them. And we got these packs with money. And we're going to make society believe what we believe. We're going to do that. We're going to elect the judges we want. We're going to elect the people that we want. And so who rules? Who rules? The greed rules. The greed rules. And, and we think that's that. I know that hurts us because we're so tightly tied to it. Sometimes I say, friend, I feel so bad for some of my people. I feel so bad for some of them. I say, oh, Lord, I wish we would have got uh, uh, Mother Teresa for, for, no, I say, I wish we would have got uh, uh, somebody good for the vice president. They said, we didn't elect Mother Teresa. I said, I really wish we would have got her to be the vice president. You don't know what he's saying. We don't want nobody who threatens what I, we believe. We don't want nobody to interfere with what we believe. What we believe political adds to my value. Bible says, love not the world. You said we need to know about all that? Yes, we need to know. Don't be fooled. He, he chastised for that. He chastised for that. He said, the children of doctrine is the wiser than the children of light. So don't walk around with your head in the sand. But boy, know what brings value. What brings value is love. What brings value is fathers staying home and taking care of their family. What values more is us nurturing those children. What values more is what values more. Just testing them is not adequate. You test them without teaching them. What are you doing? You're putting them on a the road to prison. And so we're testing them. They're failing the test. They're testing them at the third grade, this grade. Oh, Lord, that's the time we need to be home with them, teaching them. That's the time we need to get them in some good daycare centers and some exposure. Those are the times that we need to be getting the open in our mind. That's the time they needed a good diet, a good diet. Uh, those people who brought the milk to my house after my mother died, was the people who helped me. They said I began to sprout up. I served on the president's, I fell under the McGovern committee and all that. I helped create the WIC program, all of that. That all that experience come from me thinking about my mama. Those people say my brain. They say my thinking. They say my Bible reading. They say my thoughtfulness. Is healthcare important? It's vital. Jesus was a, was a healer first. They knew he was God because the miracles that he planned. They knew he was God. They knew it. no man had ever ra raised somebody from the dead, loved him so much they raised him from the dead. Jesus was a holistic person. He was concerned about whole life, whole life. Oh, we got a savior, and y'all are joining. And I think we're doing what needs to be done right now. I think we're doing what needs to be done right now. That's receiving one another. That's loving one another. It's serious. I think it's related. I think shooting up El Paso, shooting up Dayton, Shooting up this thing. I think that people feel neglected. They feel that the system don't love them. They don't even know these people they are killing. They're killing life. They're killing life. And the real question lies, whose life matter? That, don't, that didn't come from God. God never expected us to fall for that one. So, they always ask me, let me ask myself the last question. All right. <laughs> what do we need? That's what people always say. 
you know, when I get through with an interview, they said, now, you don't say everything you want to say. And now, Dr. Perkins, can tell me what it is. They do that. <laughs> the word is passion. We need to be concerned about something. And I think we can be concerned about our neighbor's brokenness. We can be concerned about our children's brokenness. Y'all, you follow me? I, I think that the young thought, do you still have passion? And every time Jesus used the word passion, he healed that person. The lady that touched him say, oh, oh, you, you, who touched me? Peter said, Lord, have mercy. You ask that kind of question in this crowd. Something special went out of me. I got to heal her. In fact, she's healed. She pulled that passion out of me. She pulled that passion. She was pressing through the crowd. So I think what we need to do is to press through some of this stuff. And that's what we're doing. I want y'all to know that. I didn't come here to condemn you. You don't put out a little wink that's burning. You don't, you don't, we don't need no more condemnation. John Perkins got enough problem. I've done enough bad stuff, you know. We need each other. We need to enter into each other's pain. And, and even as we get older, you know, what y'all thrills me with, y'all thrills me with helping me up on this step. Helping me on the step. We need each other. We need to love one another. That's what we need is that passion. Let's keep looking for it. Let's keep listening through. Let's be slow to speak, James says, quick to hear. And let, let's listen. I think listening is the key. Because you are listening for God's will. Prayer is listening. Prayer in reality is listen. What is God's will? The man of prayer in the Bible is Elijah. Elijah. He listened in the midst of the storm. And he got his direction from God. So we listen in the midst of the pain and the storms of life. And we enter that pain and begin to wash our brothers and sisters' wounds. Yeah. Passion brings us that. Doctors have passion. Yeah. Doctors start clinics all over the world. Oh, man. Doctors stop the aid ep epidemic. Doctors had to be there. So, Lord, let's pray that God would send doctors and nurses all over the world. Let's pray for Bill Gates. He doing some stuff with blood that is so powerful, that is so powerful. He's expanding life. He's working on expanding life, longevity. All of that would include old timers, those kind of disease. Uh, uh, That's uh, good. So many disease that was detected early. Uh, uh, sugar diabetes. That's a blood disease. Mm -hmm. You know, all these kind of things are just killing people. You know, so let's pray. Passion. Let's pray for that. Dr. Perkins, it's been such an honor. I mean, it's been such an honor. <laughs> such an honor. Uh, Let's all stand. And would you do us the honor of praying? Would you pray a benediction yes. over us? What a privilege. What a privilege for us to pray together. Such a privilege for me to be here with you. Oh, dear Lord. Dear Lord. Dear Lord. The symbol of y'all being here is two churches merging. The symbol of you being here now is planting other fellowships, reaching out and planting a body. Y'all believe in the collective. Oh, yes, we believe in the vision conversion. 
Well, we believe in the connection, the collectiveness of the body in a neighborhood, in a community. So, Lord, your blessing be upon this church, be upon the church plants, be upon the individuals here, and help people to discover their talent, their calling, and bring those talents into the church, into the body, and get to know each other enough that we can exchange that love with each other and exchange those talents and understand that that is the gift of God. That is the gift of God. That is the blessing of God. When you give us more of you, more of you. Bless everyone here. Lead and guide them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. As you go out, be sure to pick up a book on your way out.